it to demonstrate in a rally like this? Is there sort of safety in numbers? It's uh, the, I, I sit here and got the report from uh, the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and the demonstrators do not feel completely safe. This tonight, it was uh, more than 1,000 uh, policemen uh, were there in order to provide security and safety. So are these the people being brave? They are very brave because they cross the uh, the consensus and they stand against the consensus or we stand against the consensus that this is a war of death and life it is not such a war uh, there is a choice it is on the table and the Israeli public must relate to it now some of the demonstrators uh, were waving banners calling for, for Jewish and Palestinian states living side by by side uh, everyone generally accepts that this is now an inevitability. It's a question of, of when. Yeah. Do you think rallies like this are going to uh, speed up the process? I hope so. And uh, I'm sure that not only uh, our Palestinian colleagues in the Palestinian Peace Coalition look to what's happening in Israeli streets, especially tonight in Tel Aviv, but all over the world. Leaders, poli politicians, uh, governments, and so on, they will so see what happened tonight in Tel Aviv and they I hope will support us in the peace coalition to go ahead knowing that they have partners in Israel knowing that they have also partners in the Palestinian uh, cities uh, there is a Palestinian uh, peace coalition equivalent to our Israeli Palestinian peace coalition we cooperate all together and we need also international legitimacy and recognition and help I hope that it will help this uh, tonight's demonstration will help Malcolm Klein talking to you there. Well, Dagestan is mourning the deaths of 41 people, including 17 children, killed when a bomb went off during a Victory Day parade on Thursday. Friends and relatives of 15 Russian servicemen and a naval officer's son killed in the explosion have been paying their last respects at a remembrance service. Grief and anguish as relatives and comrades in arms walk past the 16 coffins draped in national colors. The last in the row has a photo of an 11-year-old boy who died together with his father, Colonel Alexander Kravchenko. He survived numerous ambushes in Chechnya, only to be killed on a day out with his son. His friends and relatives still cannot come to terms with this terrible irony. The leaders of Dagestan attended the ceremony to promise support for the bereaved families, but many say they are too traumatized to stay. The Marines' brass band has ceased to exist as most of its members were either killed or severely injured. Another band, that of the border guards, has come to the Marines base to play their farewell. It was the Victory Day march the Marines were playing when a terrible blast wiped them out. Nikolai Goshkov, BBC News, Moscow. The Lord's Resistant Rebel Army operating in southern Sudan is reported to have killed 470 Sudanese civilians over the past 10 days. A statement from the Roman Catholic Church says the killings took place in remote mountainous areas. 10,000 Ugandan soldiers are in Sudan trying to hunt down members of the Christian extremist group, which is largely made up of children abducted from northern Uganda. A new report obtained by the BBC says the United States has, in recent months, increased the military training it offers countries with poor human rights records. The US is now involved in training about 100,000 foreign troops each year. Human rights groups say that since September 11, there's been a relaxing of the rules governing which regimes can receive military assistance. You find the Philippine army so far. Not down there. They may try to be discreet, but American soldiers like these in the Philippines are turning up everywhere. You should be down like this. The United States' war on terrorism has led to special forces training soldiers and police in ever more countries. More than a hundred, in fact, from the battle against Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan to the war against drugs and communists in Colombia. But among the countries the U.S. helps are more than 50 with poor human rights records, according to the American State Department. It says the security forces in Indonesia have been responsible for torture, rape and beatings, not just in East Timor before independence, but across the country. In Colombia, government soldiers continue to commit extrajudicial killings as the war against the left-wing FARC rebels reaches an all-time low. 
Across the globe, in Europe, police in Ukraine have tortured and murdered prisoners. In March, the Bush administration requested more than a billion dollars in new military aid. It wants to be allowed to discard human rights conditions from Congress to prevent U.S. military aid being abused abroad. The U.S. training of various armed forces is spreading, but some grateful recipients are happy to give the war on terrorism a very wide definition. Matt Proger, BBC News. Well, the author of the report, Laura Lumpy, says her evidence is based on various fragments of U.S. government information. We, um, we pulled together all uh, sorts of different governmental reports, fragments of information on where uh, the U.S. forces are training and who they're training. Uh, unfortunately, there's no single comprehensive report on, uh, on this area of activity, and so it really took a lot of piecing together of different, different evidence. And so that figure of 100,000 is, is an estimate, but based on uh, a really solid, uh, solid information that is all coming from the government, no one um, government agency or congressional body is actually monitoring all of this activity, and that's in fact why we, we uh, put this report out. It seems quite incredible, Law, that given the how much uh, the Americans have suffered, particularly since September the 11th, that, that, that this training is still going on. Well, um, yeah, the military training by the U.S. really increased dramatically throughout the 90s. So, in fact, a lot of these places where U.S. troops are, are very publicly showing up now, they were there before September 11th. What's, what's really happened, though, since September 11th is that, that the nod toward support for human rights, which these programs were said to have, has been thrown out the window. There's been a very explicit um, uh, effort by the Bush administration, first in September, and now again in March, as your report just indicated, uh, to exempt itself from all sorts of human rights and other laws that would condition uh, the provision of this aid. And so uh, our real uh, concern and, and real interest in putting this report out is to make sure that in fighting the war on terrorism, we don't contribute to the creation of more terror by inadvertently supporting regimes that are abusing uh, their population and putting down uh, legitimate uh, movements for democracy. Can you a bit, be a bit more specific, Laura? I mean, what exactly are they training them to do? Yeah, this is a, another area of concern. Um, increasingly, we're seeing very explicitly that the training is in counterinsurgency techniques. Um, uh, that is, uh, efforts to fight internal opposition, which um, in many of the cases, the doctrine I looked at equated uh, activity such as uh, what, I, what I do, uh, uh, investigative reporting, journalism, labor union organizing, human rights monitoring, and so on, uh, unfortunately in many countries uh, is equated with uh, uh, subversive behavior and insurgent behavior. Uh, and so um, a lot of the training we're seeing now is very explicitly um, aimed at putting down internal political movements, some of which do have a military dimension, some of which uh, don't, in fact. Laura Lumpy talking to you there earlier. The French president, Jacques Chirac, has denounced football fans who jeered the French national anthem before the start of the French Cup final. The game between Bastien and Lorient was delayed after Monsieur Chirac stormed out of the VIP area in protest. It's believed that fans of the Corsican team Bastia may have been responsible. Corsican nationalists have been fighting for greater independence from France for many years. Lorient beat Bastia 1-0. Fire crews in California are fighting a large bushfire in the hills around Los Angeles. The blaze, one of the first in the state's summer-long fire season, spread quickly, destroying large areas of woodland. Some houses were threatened and people were evacuated, but there are no reports of any homes being destroyed. Around 300 firefighters were involved in the operation to bring the fire under control. Well, this is BBC News, a reminder now of the headlines. Arab leaders meeting in Egypt say they reject all forms of violence. 50,000 Israelis demonstrate in Tel Aviv to call for peace. And coming up a little later on in the programme, the end of the cat's tail. The West End musical takes its final meow. First, United Nations troops in Sierra Leone have intervened to break up riots in central Freetown as opposing political parties clashed. Several people were seriously injured by the stone-throwing supporters of the ruling party and former rebels of the Revolutionary United Front. There are elections on Tuesday, which should mark the end of the decade-long civil war. Until Saturday's clashes, the election campaign had been conducted without violence. 
Well, our correspondent Mark Doyle is in Freetown. He says the violence began after two political parties were allowed to stage marches at the same time. One by the ruling party, as you mentioned, and one by the former rebels who have laid down their arms and have now agreed to form a political party of their own. And uh, for one reason or another, it's not entirely clear why there were two marches organized at the same time, uh, but they met each other, uh, they started arguments, and then started throwing stones, and it became uh, very, very serious. Now, the election is, is quite soon. What, what are the issues being debated? The main issue it really is the record of the various parties uh, during the war. The ruling party, led by the incumbent president, Ahmed Tejan Kaba, um, is saying that he brought the United Nations force here, the largest United Nations force in the world, um, and uh, that therefore he fulfilled an election promise from the last elections and deserves to be re-elected. Uh, the, the rebels, um, who've now formed their own party and laid down their arms, as I said, um, uh, are saying that uh, really the fat cat politicians have failed Sierra Leone in the past uh, since independence from Britain uh, and that they deserve a chance to, uh, to uh, uh, try and bring the services, the education, the clean water and so on that uh, Sierra Leoneans have lacked for so long. Well, several people were, were seriously uh, injured in, in the clashes. Passion's obviously running very high. It's going to be a hard-fought race. Any idea of, of the likely outcome? I think the leading uh, favorite is um, Ahmed Tejan Kaba, the incumbent president, partly because he has the support of the international community. He was a democratically elected leader who was overthrown um, uh, once and then almost overthrown again by the rebels. The British army intervened uh, on the side of the elected government because the rebels committed widespread atrocities against civilians, and so uh, they were seen very much as uh, the bad guys in this war, and, they, and that to a large extent that was the case. They were the bad guys. Um, and so Kaba has the support of the international community, has the big advantage of incumbency, so he can use government resources in his campaign and so on. But uh, I, I think it's going to be a, quite a tight race. There, there is a very large uh, opposition party, which is not, not the rebels, uh, the former ruling party called the All People's Congress, who uh, stand a good chance of giving Kaba a run for his money. Uh, and there are a total of nine uh, presidential candidates. Uh, so it's an open question whether President Kaba will get the necessary 55% of votes cast in the first round. So it will be pretty tight. Mark Doyle there. Reports from the Pakistan-Afghan border say U.S. personnel have come under fire for the second time in recent weeks, but no one was hurt in the attacks. Witnesses say rockets were fired at a building in a remote tribal region of North Waziristan, where U.S. special forces hunting al-Qaeda and Taliban suspects are based. The Pakistan authorities deny any U.S. military presence in the semi-autonomous area.